Well, I said good morning, everyone. Uh, even though you work in online spaces, doesn't mean you get everything. Uh, so uh, I'm just glad to see everyone's faces today. Uh, as, as Dr. Basinger said, you know, I'm going to be talking about creating a new, more inclusive and sustainable normal for everyone. And uh, before I do, I just want to, I want you to take a second to reflect on the last 18 months. You know, what concerns you? How have you felt? What have you learned? I'm not going to be uh, asking you to talk about these things um, anytime soon. Maybe we can talk about them later, but I want you to see yourself in what I'm about to talk about here. I want you to think about everything that's gone on the last 18 to 20 months or so. And I want you to see yourself uh, in a lot of the things that we've experienced together. Before I go any further, as Dr. Basinger mentioned, I'm a practical theologian. I teach practical theology courses. You might be asking, what is a practical theologian? What is practical theology? And there's different kinds of theology. There's philosophical theology, historical theology, systematic theology, pastoral, uh, philosophical theology, those kinds of things. But as a practical theologian, I'm interested in the theology of the every day. I'm interested in the intersection of theology and practice and the creation of new approaches of living in light of theological convictions and realities. So that's what it means to be a practical theologian for those of you who might be a little confused about that. Even I get confused sometimes. My goal for today is to help us think through how we can create a new and more inclusive and sustainable normal. And as I was telling some folks before I got on here, I guarantee you that the United Nations is gonna have some sort of global summit on this very topic and invite leaders and scholars from across the world. And here I am, a lowly administrator at a Christian college who's gonna teach us everything I know. Um, and I just wanna invite you into what I'm learning and how I'm thinking about these things these days and hopefully bless you and minister to you as you move forward in the creation of this new inclusive and sustainable normal. The last 18 months have been hard. We've experienced a number of different things. A global pandemic, increased awareness of racial injustice, an economic recession, an extremely divisive election, and unprecedented mental health crises. And it's left us in an interesting spot today. A lot of us have increased uncertainty and fear. We still have political divisions these days. Many of us are skeptical toward authorities and institutions, the experts in the room. We've seen the predominance of conspiracy theories of so-called fake news. We've seen the dehumanization of others, right? It's easy to critique and be mean to somebody on Zoom, uh, much easier than it is to some, being with somebody in person. It's easier to dehumanize people on social media than it is to, to do it to their faces. And we're seeing a lot of that these days. We've seen increased conversations around race, social injustice, diversity, and economic troubles. And that's just sort of on the societal community scale. A lot of us are experiencing different things these days, personally and professionally. A lot of us are working much longer hours than we ever had. The idea of work-life balance is a joke to many. Many of us are feeling burnout and fatigue and stress, anxiety, depression, strained relationships because of all the different things we've been through as a nation and as a, as a world. And moreover, mental, physical health decline, anxiety, depression, stress, obesity, these kinds of things, right? It's left us all in a very difficult spot. And I'll say this, perhaps we are the least healthy and least united than we have been in recent history. I know we can point to other different uh, eras of history where we've seen a lack of health or a lack of unity, but in recent history, we seem to be at a crossroads with little idea of how to move forward. But let me posit this to you. Maybe the pandemic wasn't the great disruptor. Maybe it was the great revealer. The last couple of years have revealed the ways that we dehumanized others and ourselves. And here's what the pandemic revealed. Here's just a few things that we've, that the pandemic has revealed. An overemphasis on productivity. We believe as good Americans that we are what we produce, that um, the kinds of things that we do identify us as who we are. We have a lack of awareness of all the different kinds of disparities that are out there, racial, health, economic, educational disparities. Many of us weren't aware of these things until the pandemic hit. We do emphasize a lack of self-care these days. We take great pride in the idea that we work all the time. I was up busy working late last night. Look at me, I just work so much. We've seen to diminish the idea of self-care. 
And some of us, we've experienced the inability to see the suffering of others and care for others. A lot of us are fatigued. Many of us are burnt out. I know many of us have Zoom fatigue. I have Zoom fatigue. A lot of us are overworked um, because, like I said, there's a lack of work-life balance these days. And we see a lot of these different metaphors floating around too. We're robots, right? We just keep going and going and going. We're the Energizer Bunnies. We keep going and going and going. But I don't think that that's left us in a very healthy place. So the question is, how can we move forward? Amidst all the challenges that we're facing as a nation, as a globe, as a community, how can we move forward? Here's what I wanna to posit to you today that we need to rehumanize ourselves and others. We need to begin with some theological resources. We always have to go back to the Bible and theology, amen? We need to recover a few different things, but first we need to recover the omago dei, the idea that all of us are created in the image of God, that we have inherent dignity and value and worth, that we are royal over against the ancient Near East cultures that would dehumanize folks, that would have a hierarchy of, of human beings. What does God say in Genesis chapter one? Let us create everyone, all people in our image. It's a very democratic way of looking at things, that all are equal. There's no hierarchy of human beings. All hierarchies are socially constructed things. And if you look, at, if you look throughout history, if you look at our world today, We've seen a number of violations of the Imago Dei, from the Crusades to colonialism, slavery, segregation, human trafficking, redlining, systemic racism, sexism, the disparities of all kinds, violence of all kinds. This is something that we as a world haven't done very well. We as humanity have not taken this idea very seriously. And as Christians, those of us who follow Christ, Christ is the Imago Dei exemplar. He's the perfect image of the invisible God. We're able to look at him, guidance, life, and of course, our ultimate salvation and hope. What if we viewed all people as created in the image of God? We all say it all the time, right? You can't take a class at NES at RWC without talking about the idea that we're all created in the image of God. But what if we actually took it seriously? How would that change the way that we think about society? And how would it change the way that we think about ourselves and others? I think we need to rediscover Sabbath. You know, I think in a lot of our circles, Sabbath sort of, Sabbath sort of has a negative reputation. That's something they did in the old days, but we're under Christ. We're not under the law anymore. We can work on Sundays. It's a free for all. Or we often devolve into sort of a, uh, a really abstract version of the Sabbath. Well, Christ is our ultimate rest and hope. That doesn't mean that I have to rest or anything on the Sabbath. But I think if we recover the idea of Sabbath, it would change a lot about how we think about ourselves and our need for rest, our need to recover from certain things. A lot of folks don't realize this, but Sabbath was an idea that is over against the kinds of uh, ideologies, the, the environment that the Israelites experienced under Egyptian slavery. Let's look at Exodus. It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor male nor female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in the six days the Lord made heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. This has sort of a creation feel to it, doesn't it? That not only am I supposed to take a day off, but everything around me, we're supposed to give the land a break. The Egyptians drove the Israelites into the ground, working them day and night, and they had gods. They had theological support for this idea. But Yahweh comes along and says, no, that's not how we're going to do things. As image bearers, you are not going to be subject to the kinds of violent ideologies that you experienced under slavery in Egypt. It's a time of rest for all creation. What if we recognized that we need rest in order to feed our souls, to care for our bodies, and to subvert unhealthy labor paradigms? I think we also need to reimagine love. 
Now, my father used to say as a good Sunday school teacher, he said, you know what? If you want to get an answer right in Sunday school, uh, the answer is always this. It's either Jesus or love. And chances are you're going to get the answer right if you answer one of those, uh, answer with one of those. But I want to draw our attention back to what the Bible says about the two greatest commandments. Matthew chapter 22. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And here's what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. I emphasize that as yourself, because whenever we summarize it in our evangelical circles, we say, love God, love neighbor. But there's a key part there to love our neighbors as ourselves. How would, it we, how would it look if we took that as yourself part seriously? These three things, these theological resources, the redis, recovering of the Imago Dei, the idea that we're all created in the image of God, worthy of dignity, respect, the idea that we need to rediscover Sabbath, that we're more than our productivity, that we are human beings created in the image of God that need rest. We need to recover from the work week in some ways. We need to remind ourselves not of who we are because of our work, but who we are, whose we are. We need to reimagine love, not just love for others, but loving others as we love ourselves. I think if we embrace these three key theological, idea, key theological ideas, we'll begin the process of rehumanization. We'll begin to see ourselves as humans and see others as human beings as well. And this is the way I think that we need to create a new, more inclusive, sustainable normal. I think we need to cultivate humanizing habits. Uh, and now, like I said, you know, I don't have all the answers here, but this is where my mind has been lately. How can we create a new, more inclusive, sustainable normal that helps us and equips us deal with the problems that are going to come up in society? How does it help us uh, navigate different troubles that come up in our relationships, in our communities, in our institutions? Here are some things that I've been thinking about lately, and I'm looking forward to having a great conversation afterwards. I think we need to listen more. And it sounds so simplistic, but we need to hear the experiences of those who have lived lives differently than ours. And we need to take those experiences seriously. And when it comes time to respond after listening and hearing how people have experienced different things, racism, sexism, injustice of all kinds, we need to respond with a posture of empathy, of curiosity, to learn more so we can act better. And listening, we need to continually grow in our understanding of how others experience the world because times change. Admittedly, you don't think the same way as you did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Many of us don't think the same way that we did 20 months ago. I think we need to listen well. In addition, we need to learn. It sounds really good because we're an educational institution, but we need to read broadly and we need to read deeply. We need to learn perspectives that aren't our own. If we believe that all human beings are created in the image of God, then all human beings have something important to say to you. The people that make us uncomfortable, the people that we normally wouldn't socialize or hang out with, those are the kinds of stuff that we need to be learning because it helps us humanize the experiences of others. And as we learn, we need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. We don't like being uncomfortable. It puts us into interesting places that we don't want to go. And yet this is how we learn. This is how we grow as human beings when we learn from others and humanize their experiences because they are humans created in the image of God. Yeah, listen to this. We're done with what he says. Yeah, I think you yeah. can. We need to listen and we need to learn. Why? Because it enables us to see others as humans. It empowers us to take redemptive action and serves as a means of loving others. Think about this last time somebody listened to something that you had to say. Somebody uh, called on you in a meeting because they knew you had something beautiful to say and you spoke up even though you were afraid and how it transformed the shape of the meeting. Maybe new policies or programs were created. Good things happen when we listen and learn from others. 
this is a good way to love others and embody that second commandment, that great second commandment. A lot of that is very other focused, the listening, the learning. Let's talk about ourselves, the need to rest, the ways that we need to take Sabbath seriously. Think about the ways that we talk about work in society. I can't take vacation. What if somebody takes my job? I was reading some statistics the other day that said that the average American works 50 hours a week and doesn't take vacation because they're afraid of getting replaced. Those are the kinds of ideologies that are swirling around in our culture. What if we as Christians, as a community, took this idea of Sabbath seriously, that we're not, become, we're not gonna become enslaved to these ideologies that tax our bodies and our souls, but we're gonna rest because our ultimate faith is in Yahweh and what Yahweh is gonna do in us. I like this quote, like good dough, you need to rest so you can rise. For all the bread makers out there, I, I, I hope that that resonates because it's true. If you don't let the bread rise, it's going to come out flat. It's not going to come out delicious and fluffy. It's going to come out disgusting. Like good dough, we need to rest so that we can rise. Another thing, too, is that rest, the studies show that rest produces productivity. It feeds productivity. But not just be, we don't rest just because we want to produce something. Rest is good in and of itself because we are human beings who need rest. And related to that, we do need to care for ourselves. We need to prioritize self-care, eating well, sleeping well, family time, you know, building in habits of saying no to overcommitment. And, I, and honestly, I am, a, I am the number one offender of this because I say yes to everything. But I think a part of self-care and humanizing ourselves is to say no to overcommitment, to say, I'm going to focus on these few things and do these things well. Uh, and rather than doing many things inadequately. Think about the message that that sends to the world, that we're gonna care for ourselves because we believe that we are human beings created in the image of God who are worthy, who have dignity, who are worthy of love and respect and who need rest so that we can rise. Think about the message that this sends to people. Think about how much, how better of a world would we have if people were allowed to take care of themselves and didn't feel pressured to do things all the time. And finally, listening and learning and resting and self-caring leads us to other care. I don't think you can listen and learn and rest and care for yourself without being compelled or empowered to care for others. You know, the Bible talks all about this. Look at the epistles of Paul. You know, do this for one another, do that for one another, love one another, serve one another, bear one another's burdens. Christianity is a very other focused communal kind of religion, kind of space. We need to find ways of serving through the church and community partnerships. And hopefully this rhythm of learning and listening and caring for ourselves empowers us to seek justice on behalf of others, not only in our communities, but in society as well. Together, these humanizing habits rooted in the idea that we need to recover the Omagra day to rediscover the idea of Sabbath and to reimagine what love means to love others as ourselves. Taking these humanizing habits of listening and learning and resting and self-care and other care enable us to build a new, more inclusive and sustainable normal. Why? Because we'll be better equipped to handle the challenges that come our way as a society. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Can we all just take a moment to appreciate Ben and his presentation this, mor this morning, this afternoon? Um, I am working on my ventriloquist skills. So if my, uh, my, the sound of my voice and my mouth don't match up, it's because I'm still practicing that. And I think I need to put in a call to IT. But in the meantime, we want to now open up this time for some discussion. Um, ben has brought up some really interesting topics for us to um, kind of apply what we know as people of faith to the specific situation we find ourselves in. So I invite you, if you have a question or a comment, please go ahead and unmute your microphone and I will call on you 
or you can put your comment in the chat and that will be um, really helpful. And uh, Meg has asked Ben if you could share your slides with us. Um, Michelle, maybe that's something if, if Ben can provide them, we can share those in tandem with the recording after. I see Michelle nodding her head. So uh, Ben, are you willing to do that? Yes, absolutely. Okay, super. So if you get those to Michelle after we're done, she'll make sure they're included with the recording. So I'm looking to see, um, yes, Colleen is happy that that's going to happen as well. So thank you for doing that, Ben. Um, go ahead and unmute your microphone if you have a question or a comment, or you can put it in the chat. Who will be brave and kick off our discussion? Surely something has sparked a thought in your mind as you've heard these ideas shared and reflect on the last 18 months. How, how are you doing in these areas and, and uh, what wisdom can you gain from Ben? Looking for that first brave person to kick us off. Okay, Marie is gonna kick us off with a question in the chat. Um, ben, what do you think will be the biggest challenge of those options you've given us, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge to creating this new, this new inclusive, sustainable normal? Well, you know, the uh, in a way they're all challenging, but I think in a more accurate way, I think it's very easy for us to um, to hear that we need to rest more, that we need to care for ourselves, and stuff that we don't do very well. Um, so that's challenging, but. I would say even more challenging than that is the idea of, of learning from other people's experiences, uh, which is why the arts and humanities are, are so incredibly important, right? Because these are our, um, our artifacts essentially of the human experience, right? The, the joy, the pain that you go through, the experiences that you go through, um, being the recipient of different um, injustices in society. I would say that learning and maybe even reading broadly is the most challenging because A, we don't like to read. Uh, maybe watching YouTube is even better, but to step outside our comfort zones, uh, to listen to perspectives that we know that we might initially disagree with, but may come to appreciate and even like. I think one of the beauties of the Wesleyan tradition is like, we're willing to draw from all different kinds of traditions and ideas to make sense of the world. And in my, um, in, uh, in Latino churches and Latino theology, there's this beautiful idea of theología en conjunto, the idea that we do theology and community in our context to make sense of the world. We'll draw from Catholic theologians, Protestant theologians, we'll draw from the sociologists to better make sense of the world. Um, but it begins with the intention of stepping outside of our comfort zones and engaging ideas and even populations with which we're not comfortable or we know we might even disagree with initially. So very good question. Um, it's easy to care for ourselves and lean into that, but I think it's even harder to intentionally put ourselves into uncomfortable postures. That's great, great. Thank you for that question, Maria, and that response, Ben. Let's keep, the, keep it going here. We have one from, um, from Will. What if serving others is what we are having trouble saying no to? What a great question. I can feel that one. Well, what do, what do you say to that, Ben? What if, what if the trouble, if serving others is exactly the thing you need to say no to? Yeah, you know, I'm always reminded of, of, the, um, of, of the adage, like when you're in an interview and uh, somebody asks you, like, what are your weaknesses? Well, you know, I work too hard. I volunteer too much, right? Um, that's a very good question. You know, I would say that your ability to serve others is dependent on your ability to care for yourself. Um, and, and, and I would say that self-care probably plays into this, right? Because if there's nothing left of you to give, if you haven't cared for yourself in proper ways, then you're not gonna be able to care for others too. Uh, so I, I definitely agree that it's, it's hard to say no to, uh, to serving others, uh, especially those of us who are very service oriented. But I think we need to reorient and say, I can't serve others well or effectively unless I've actually cared for myself first, that I'm prioritizing eating well and sleeping well, praying, Bible study, these kinds of disciplines that form and shape us into the character of Christ. I can't do serving or loving others um, adequately until I've cared for myself spiritually, physically, emotionally, those kinds of things. Um, and it sounds very selfish, right? It's, it's very uh, me-centered. We don't like talking about that. I, I think at least in, in the Christian circles that we're in. 
but I think it's an idea that we need to, to recover and, uh, and really practice. So I don't have a great answer, but I think self-care needs to uh, be a part of the equation. Yeah, that's, that's great, Ben. It makes me think of the instructions that we tend to ignore when we're on an airplane, when we're told to put our own oxygen mask on first, yeah. right? And then help others where our instinct, if we're sitting there with a child or we're sitting beside someone who's vulnerable, our instinct would automatically be to care for that other person. But we need to make sure that we have um, given ourselves the resources we need so, yes, I see that Rebecca is unmuted. Please, uh, if you have a comment or question, Rebecca Letterman, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. So, um, Ben, thanks. Um, really appreciated this. And um, just, just a thought of something that might actually connect uh, self-care questions with um, listening to others. Um, I recently heard a talk in which um, they were, it was, the context was actually uh, discussing trauma, different kind of trauma people experience. And, and in the broadest sense, arguably, we all experience some kind of traumas on, the, on a broad continuum of trauma. If you're, if you're familiar with, with those uh, concepts, you, you, that's not a new idea. But something that I thought was interesting was this was actually a session that talked about one of the reasons that we have trouble doing self-care. That is, we often know we should do self-care. Um, we'll tell other people to do self-care, and sometimes we're still not self-caring. And the, the hypothesis that this person put forward that I thought was pretty wise <clears throat> was that that can be a place to look at trauma. Because if we've experienced certain kind of trauma, uh, often what we'll do is we will shut down our feelings around whatever to protect ourselves. And we don't even know how to experience pleasure and joy. Mm -hmm. Because when you shut, you can't selectively shut down particular feelings. <clears throat> and so one of the things that they suggested was, uh, first of all, that makes me curious. So if I find myself struggling with, like I know I should self-care, but I'm not, um, that makes me curious about, hmm, I wonder if there's something under that. Okay. One of the suggestions they offered was to practice, some, to explore that and to also practice small enjoyments, allowing yourself to just enjoy small pleasures as a way to begin to tap into that because that's linked with self-care. And then the other piece of it that I thought's really interesting is um, that when we listen to people with whom we really disagree or just have a very different perspective, often that activates our nervous system in the same way that trauma patterns do. And so I think uh, now when I notice that in myself, if I notice I'm listening and I'm getting physically activated, um, that, that makes me curious like okay there's something here and I actually heard somebody suggest that um, one of the wisest things you can do is to go on to YouTube and practice listening to people who you know really irritate you so that you can learn to pay attention to your body's responses and explore that a bit and, and maybe get some freedom so to me I'm sorry to talk that long but the, the trauma piece of that was a very interesting one activation around that to link together both the difficulty we have listening to others and the difficulties of self-care. Oh, that, that, that's, uh, there, there's a lot I want to respond to there, Rebecca. I thank you for sharing that. I, I was thinking more as you were talking about self-care and what might inhibit us from doing that. I think the narratives that we tell ourselves that unless I'm working all the time, unless I'm busy all the time, then, I'm, then um, I don't deserve any sort of self-care kind of thing. You know, I am my work and I find my worth in my work. Um, but I think if we step out and, uh, you know, kind of try and smash that narrative as best as we can, uh, then I think we'll find self-care easier, that we are human beings first and foremost, loved by God, cherished by God, um, and that we're more than our productivity. And that might be a way that we can get us to the idea of self-care. But to your second question, I worked with a professor in graduate school who was into um, emotionality, and he, he always uh, loved the idea that emotions are the language of the soul. So one of the things he always talked about was, you know, when you go into a class and you hear an idea that you don't like, you know, you can disagree with it, but he wanted to see how you felt about it. Did this make you angry? Did this make you sad? It's like, and what does that tell you about how you really feel deep in your heart? And he had this practice that he walked us through. And it's amazing the kind of stuff you can uncover, the different kinds of, um, uh, things, the factors, the experiences, the traumas that we've experienced that have shaped our intellectual development 
and, uh, and inhibit us from embracing certain ideas on an emotional basis. We rationalize it uh, through, in, through intellectual discourse. So that's such a good thing. And I'm, I'm thinking about some people that I dislike on YouTube, and that sounds very difficult. But I might have to do that just to kind of, you know, uh, um, like uh, awaken some, um, some inspiration within me. So I appreciate you sharing that. That was really good, Rebecca. Yeah, such a such a helpful suggestion, Rebecca. Thank you for adding your insight to that. I see Wayne McCallan has his um, his microphone unmuted, and he's been waiting patiently for us. Wayne, what would you like to add or ask? Thank you. There are several um, references here made to the role of the body. Um, Rebecca was mentioned that in her comments, and then rest, of course, uh, includes bodily rest as well as emotional and, and uh, perhaps social rest and the like. But uh, the comment I want to add in here is that as a person who is approaching my 80th birthday now, in my peer group, I recognize that one's physical health tends to be the baseline for all other uh, and many other aspects of life in terms of productivity, quite frankly. Your physical health is either an asset or uh, a limitation, but in many other ways of serving others, of caring for others, unless you have good uh, physical health, you are going to be restricted in terms of what you can do. And I'm saying this by way of, of sort of exhorting all, most of you are younger than myself, you need to take care of yourself in terms of your body and your physical well-being as well. And of course, we've been made more aware of this during the pandemic, which has hammered uh, people physically uh, in crisis modes, but long term and the like. And we're all aware of persons who have been really uh, severely uh, uh, damaged and hurt. And then within uh, social and communal and family structures, those who have become very ill have impacted then the whole uh, fabric of community around themselves as, as well. So I'm just making an appeal to you. When you think about self-care, don't forget the body aspect. I know we tend to go to the spiritual side of things and the emotional side of things, but there's the bodily aspect as well that's a part of holistic self-care. I appreciate that, Wayne. That's good. I think um, to speak to the experience, I'll go just a little personal here. You know, uh, many of you know I came here January 2020, uh, right before a big uh, global catastrophe, right? And in the midst of that, I was finishing my doctorate, starting a new job, uh, moved in with my in-laws with whom we had uh, various disagreements about a whole host of things. Uh, and we had our second child. And we moved into um, a house, uh, our, our own house here. And uh, the, the stress of all those transitions and all the things going into that, uh, mentally it was a lot, but I think physically it, it took its toll on me. I mean, I went probably a month without sleeping, uh, probably in July or August, you know, and it really, it, it kind of um, kicked me out of my comfort zone a little bit. Uh, and forced me to think more seriously about the idea of Sabbath and of self-care because of the reasons that you're saying how physical health, um, uh, it, it almost, it affects everything else. I remember thinking, well, should I do this? Should I do that? And I talked to my father. I said, you know, he, he told me, you need to sleep. That's the thing you got to start with, sleep. And you got to go to eat well too. And then you got to find time to rest. And I thought I was trying to over-intellectualize and say, well, it could be this, could be that, whatever. But once I was able to focus on those key foundational things, everything else clicked into place. So I just want to emphasize that and kind of reaffirm and amen to that, Wayne. I believe that you got to take care of the body because everything else uh, flows from that. Wonderful. We have a few more minutes. We probably can entertain one or two more questions. So if you have not had a chance to ask a question or make a comment, you can either put it in the chat or you can unmute your microphone. Esther, I see that you are unmuted. Please go ahead and share with us. I just wanted to comment about the Sabbath piece, uh, Dr. Espinoza, that you shared. Uh, my 
my parents practiced good Sabbath um, methodology or behavior or whatever. But as I got buried and moved out from under my parents' house, I sort of lost that piece. And it wasn't until I went to uh, Northeastern that I, I picked that piece up again, thanks to Dr. Letterman's teaching in, in classes and so on. And it became a very important part for me. And I teach that now as I'm teaching the spiritual formation classes here at Regent. And invariably get the same reaction every time. Uh, oh, I couldn't possibly put Sabbath in my life. I'm way too busy. I have way too many commitments. Um, I d there, there are things that wouldn't get done that are very, very important. Uh, I, d I just can't. And so uh, I began recommending that they find ways to sneak Sabbath into their lives by way of creating margins. So don't eat lunch at your desk, step out of your office, take a walk. Um, all of those little pieces where we push ourselves over the edge, uh, you know, when you get, when you're at home, don't stay up watching something on TV until 11 o'clock. Move that up a little bit and put some, you know, margin there where you're not constantly being um, stimulated by the world in which you find yourself immersed. And invariably, the students who will try it are amazed at how their schedule clears up. Suddenly, they get things done in a lot less time. So there's benefits beyond just realigning with the things of God. Um, I think the, the Lord steps in and uh, shakes your, your calendar up and says, all right, let's get rid of some of these things and, and let's help you do these other things uh, more efficiently so that you're not wasting so much time. Um, but the thing, the piece that I have to constantly fight against as I'm talking about this is that we tend to hold up examples of people who are great on the basis of all that they are doing and have accomplished at the same time. And so that's a difficult American misconception of what a good life looks like that we have to constantly fight against and we have to validate and honor those who are living a Sabbath filled life that has margin, that gives us the opportunity that fills our cup to overflowing. So where we have time to listen to other people and to respond to them, to think about them. So I'm very grateful to Northeastern for teaching me again the importance of Sabbath. I really appreciate that, uh, the, especially the piece about margin. I found that, you know, and when I look at my calendar and I have a few minutes, I, I'll go take a walk to the other side of campus and just clear my head and just spend time with God. And I find, you know, th this will encourage both of, my both of my bosses who are on the call right now. I actually find myself more productive when I do that. Um, so, and, but it's, it's not just a, a means to an end. It's, it's, it's an end in of itself. It's just a good thing to do. And speaking of Dr. Letterman, I have a, a long email that she sent me on Saturday and I refused to answer it because I was taking Sabbath. So I know you'd be proud of me, Rebecca. <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. Well, I see that Dr. Gerhardt has her microphone unmuted. And then I have another question in the chat if we have time. So please thank you for your patience, Beth. Uh, sure. Just a quick comment. First of all, thanks, Ben, uh, so much. And I'm so happy to see you emphasizing listening. Um, I've been convinced that listening is key for humanization and even further for healing. A few years ago, right before the shutdown, I had an opportunity to travel to El Paso and then over the border to Juarez and spend time at a shelter there. And my whole goal was I'm just going to listen, keep my mouth shut. <laughs> and listen um, to the stories. And although I had all this knowledge, I teach on immigration, so forth, listening to the stories, spending those hours, listening to those who had traveled from all over Central America, Cuba, um, the suffering that they encountered at the border. And then they continued to say to me, please tell people, please tell Americans that we're human beings, that we're like them. Please go back and tell people. So the, the process of listening for me, uh, well, I knew nothing before. I, I, I had the head knowledge. I know the I know all that. Um, but this the storytelling was what was so impactful and that they connected that listening 
uh, right? I think the psychologist Eric Erickson talks about it is positive regard. Just deep listening is a, engages everyone in the process of humanization, both the listener and um, the, the person um, that's, that's telling their narratives. Um, yeah, and just real quick, another two sentences. Another um, experience around that time was with 12 women who had been abused and 12 men who were interested in engaging in the process of ending gender side violence against women with a listening circle where the women, 12 women went one by one telling their stories. The men had to sit on the outside and just listen, not comment, not give a dissertation, just listen and then later reflect. And I don't know if there was a man listening to the stories who didn't end up crying and saying afterwards, you know what? I thought I was so knowledgeable in this area, but listening to the stories has changed me. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for bringing out that the process of listening is just so key uh, for healing, for humanization, for, for change. Awesome, I definitely appreciate that, Beth. Uh, you know, whenever I talk to pastors or church leaders about, particularly about racial injustice, uh, I always say you need to listen first because, you know, pastors are always asked to, to talk about things and comment and provide a perspective on things, but you really need to begin with that listening first. Um, maybe even you're led not to say anything. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. We have another question in the chat from um, Cassie. As, as church leaders, how do we do a better job of recognizing when our volunteers are overdue for rest? And I think that could work for anyone who's in a, a supervisory role and has a, a team. How do we recognize when our volunteers and the people on our team are overdue for rest? Yeah, you know, I, um, I'm just going to think out loud here. I, I think it's important that we create a space for people to voice those kinds of things, you know, and that, you know, before someone volunteers or you get into that volunteering or supervisory relationship, you say, look, I need to hear when you're burned out, you know, what are your signs of burnout and fatigue and stress, you know, we don't want you to, to come near it, you know, so let me know, let's communicate um, about those things, let's have a reciprocal relationship here, and I, and I, I think as a leader, it's very important that we, um, that we model that for others too, that we take the vacation, that we take the days off, that we let people know, hi, I'm not gonna be responsive for two days because I'm gonna go and take vacation. And you know what, I encourage you to do the same. You know, So I, I think it begins having a very open, honest conversation about those kinds of things. And as leaders, the impetus is on us to create a space like that and to model it too, because we're very terrible. I mean, I'm looking at my calendar, all things I have to do and it's like, okay, you know what? I'm going to say no to some of these things uh, because uh, people need to see that it's, it's okay. You know? And even now I feel uncomfortable saying that, but it's okay to say no. And it's okay to say that, yeah, I'm burned out on this. And it's okay to be honest because ultimately if we're not honest with each other, then, then there's something else wrong too. So, so that, I, that may not answer the question, but it's, you know, that's my gut response to it. So, so very true, so very true. And, you know, Joy Rebstein had a question a little earlier that um, she felt like uh, Esther answered for her perfectly, but I just wanna make sure that I, I, I read it and, and acknowledge it here. Joy said, how do you balance the challenge in academia of getting your work done while also learning new and innovative ways to do your work? She said, I don't believe reading academic journals or books related to my work is part of downtime, but that's also the only time I can fit it in. Any suggestions? So she really appreciated Esther's comment about margin. Is there anything you would add to that then for Joy? Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, as academics, I think all of us, regardless of the roles that we have, I think it's, you know, I don't want to uh, be too specific here, but I, I, I think it's a part of our role to be learners too. Um, and even though that might not be uh, spelled out in the job description, I think it, it needs to go uh, more explicitly said that as an educational institution, we're all learning something. And if you need to take an hour to read something that's taken away from other things, 
that hour of reading is going to empower you to, to make a big difference, right? So it's investing in yourself on the job so that you can continue being productive. Again, it's, 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 uh, it's good for its own sake, but it also helps us be productive in our work too, inspires us to take it in new, gen uh, new directions too.